Good evening, and thank you so much for joining us at the Free Library of Philadelphia at Home. My name is Laura Kovacs, executive producer of Author Events, and it is a pleasure to be your host this evening. And thank you very much for staying with, the, with us as we worked out some technical difficulties. Before we begin tonight's presentation, I'd like to point out a few useful features on your screen. You'll see there's a button below that suggests that you buy a copy of our guest's new book, the firsts, the inside story of the women reshaping Congress. The button links to the website of the Joseph Fox Bookshop, and they will be happy to send you a copy of the book anywhere. You'll also see the ask a question link, which you can use to ask a question, suggest a topic, or upvote a question by using the arrows in the left margin. It is now my honor to introduce our guest. Jennifer Steinhauer has covered many high-profile beats in her 25-year reporting career at the New York Times, from City Hall Bureau Chief and Los Angeles Bureau Chief to Capitol Hill. She won the Newswoman's Club of New York Front Page Deadline Reporting Award for her powerful work covering Hurricane Katrina. In November 2018, the largest number of women ever was elected to Congress ushered in on a groundswell of grassroots support and diverse in background, age, personal experience, and ideology. The first delivers new details, inside access, historical perspective, and expert analysis to chronicle their first year in Congress and what a year it was. Jennifer, the screen is all yours. I will- Hi everyone, thank you so much. Really cool things um, about going from live events, which we intended to do um, in Philadelphia, obviously, to a virtual event, is that we can actually have more people sometimes get together, even from like other places in the country. So that's really nice to be able to be with all of you tonight, um, in even in a, in a virtual space. Um, the downside is sometimes we hit some technical difficulties, so we had a little, little, um, a bit of a procedural problem. Um, so we apologize for that. But uh, thank you for hanging in there and, and being so patient and joining us tonight. And, and thank you um, so much uh, to the library uh, from the state of the Fab Four, uh, which you all know, uh, four women to, to join from your state to join the House in this historic class in Congress. So I want to just talk a little bit. Um, I also want to hear from you guys and, and get your questions because I feel like that um, will be most interesting for you to talk about the book, talk about women in politics and, and power. Um, talk a little bit about uh, 2020 if you want to um, in terms of women. Um, I want just to give you um, two things, a little sense about how the book came about and how I went about um, reporting it. And then I'm going to read a little bit, not too long, um, and I will explain why I picked the passage that I chose to read tonight um, before I do so. So after the 2018 midterm elections, I got a call from my very fabulous editor at Algonquin, Betsy Blake, who said she was very interested in all the women who had won um, and uh, and were responsible by their large wins to returning democratic power to the House of Representatives. And she had a particular interest in what is alluded to um, in obviously the title of the book, the first, some of these women who were the first of their kind, the youngest woman in the House, obviously um, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, the first two Muslim women, um, um, Rashida Tlaib from Michigan, Ilhan Omar from Minnesota, the first two Native American women, Sharice Davids from Kansas City, Kansas, and Deb Holland from the um, from New Mexico. A lot of women were first, including in your state, the first woman to win their seat in that district. Um, many people who were the first minority to win their seat, uh, the first person with their particular background. I often um, when I talk about um, these women, I talk about Lauren Underwood, She's one of the women who may not have gotten quite as much attention as some of the other women who won that year, but she's from the suburbs of Chicago. She grew up in her district, um, and she it's a not about a 98% white district, and she's African-American. She was the first female, the youngest person, and the first woman to win that district. So she was um, a trifecta of firsts, and there were a lot of folks who won that year that were in that in that space. So um, of course I said, great, let's I'll take, I'd love to take this task on. I had 
been covering Congress sort of off and on and, and being sort of a denizen of Capitol Hill since 2010. When I moved to Washington, prior to that, I spent most of my career in New York, as she alluded to, but um, uh, and four years in Los Angeles right prior to moving to Washington, D.C. in 2010. And um, at that point, when I moved here, Republicans shortly thereafter took over the House in their own revolution. It was the Tea Party Revolution, as you may recall from the time. And I spent a lot of time following those freshmen around and and learning, um, kind of trying try to sort of track whether they were going to change Washington or Washington was going to change them. And I would argue they changed Washington quite a bit. Um, and they set the stage for a decade of what would become the, the evolution of the Republican Party, starting with that Tea Party revolution, um, which obviously, as you all may recall, was a, was a was sort of in reaction both to the Affordable Care Act and also to um, TARP and other sort of government programs. And uh, and it was about supposedly about you know fiscal restraint. And that quickly moved into, um, it kind of morphed into this sort of far right conservatism that you see dominating the party, which then moved into a, the populist movement. You know, I, I would think um, kind of really, I would set the marker with Sarah Palin, who I think is very much a precursor to Donald Trump and um, the progenitor of, of, this, of the movement, uh, culminating in Donald Trump's election in 2016, which then shortly after that, um, even though a lot of Republicans resisted him, obviously he kind of became the definition of the party. And I think we can all probably agree that at present the American Republican Party is very much the party of Donald Trump. And so go to 2018, the midterm elections and all these women who, who ran and not just women obviously, but so many women, some of them who had been in politics before their state legislatures um, and other jobs, but many who had not, who kind of ran uh, in response to that. Um, and and kind of the, the, the clapback, if you will, to Donald Trump. Now, some of that took place um, in the far kind of more progressive end of the party, the Bernie wing, if you will. And those were women that quickly gained a lot of attention. Uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez from New York, she beat a Democratic incumbent who'd been in that seat for many years in New York City, was thought to be, you know, uh, possibly a potential speaker in not too long. Um, Ayanna Presley from Boston, she'd been in the city council there. She beat a Democratic incumbent. Ilhan Omar um, ran in an open seat um, in a safe Democratic district, where she did to leave and met um, met on Capitol Hill, and you know quickly became known. Oh, sorry, it was a joke, but then it became they became known as the Squad, and they were sort of representing the progressive end of the party and these Democrats who picked off sitting Democrats, um, and um, and quickly not too long thereafter became came in the crosshairs of Donald Trump and became elevated in the sense that a lot of people obviously knew them from their campaigns or certainly when they got to Congress weren't paying attention. And because he singled them out as sort of the symbol of the, of the Democratic Party, um, they got a lot of national attention. But there were a whole lot of other women um, who won in seats that were held by Republicans, um, including in, in your fair state. And um, many of them, many of those women had a military or national security background. And I have long argued that they're sort of more of the squad, if you will, because they knew each other, a lot of them before the campaign, they campaigned together. Um, they were brought together by Vote Vets, a PAC that, that gets um, veterans uh, to elect Democrats who are veterans. They campaigned a lot together. They knew each other when they got to Capitol Hill. They really formed a close bond. They tried to get offices near each other as much as can be done in an office lottery. Because <laughs> everything in D.C. is very much a seniority system. And they also um, spent a lot of time uh, talking together on legislation and, and often vote more in a block than the so-called squad. So that's um, a little bit of a flavor for some of the women. And there are a lot of women in kind of all points in the spectrum, if you will. Um, so those women who won Republican districts, though, are very important to me to always bring up because even though some of the Democratic women who are uh, basically, you know, more the titular heads of, or at least the public faces of the progressive end of the party, um, had to have their role and have done a lot to change the policy discussion, um, and elevate certain issues, they're not the reason that Democrats took back the House. They're not the reason that Nancy Pelosi, the first female speaker to ever hold the gavel twice, was able to do that. That was women and men, obviously, but more women who took Republican seats and, and turned the House back. However, um, having said that, and I think that's very important to talk about the, um, the ethnic 
racial, professional, geographic diversity of all these women who've made the house so fascinating and who've made this transition so interesting because they are from so many different backgrounds um, and so had such impressive lives before they even arrived on Capitol Hill, which would come back to bite them through frustration, which we can talk about. But I want to return to um, the squad. I want to return to um, Rashida Tlaib, Ayanna Presley, and AOC, who went to the border to Veronica Escobar. She is a freshman from um, uh, the border of Texas. She took Beto O'Rourke's seat. And she was very known in local politics there for a long time, knew a lot about the border issues, obviously. And uh, this was during the period of ch ch child separation from families. And you know about the facilities, obviously, that were down at the border. And a lot of members of Congress were visiting the border um, and reporting back to their constituents ab about the conditions there. And so they went down, it was a very high profile visit. They went down to Veronica's, um, Veronica Escobar's district and they held a press conference and they talked about the conditions that they had seen and they were very um, upset about it. And there were a lot of protesters who gathered at the press conference and they were hanging signs and um, they hold, holding signs and throwing burritos at them and you know a lot of really um, um, offensive and, and racist comments to them. And so um, to me uh, in writing the book that scene really struck me. So I'm gonna just read a quick little passage about that scene and then kind of what I think about how Americans received that. Um, and then we can go ahead and, um, and and move on with the program. But I just wanna kind of start there, even though I wanna preface it by saying, this is not the story of all women in Congress. This is not the story of all the women in the house. This isn't even the story of, um, of what happened when they all got there, which in many ways had a lot of tensions between uh, the left and moderates, which presaged what we saw in the primary for the White House this year. But this is a, this was an important thing, I think. So I start there under the hot sun was the story of the United States in 2019. Two political experiments on a collision course, Trumpism and multiculturalism, a reverence for a mythical white American past embodied by the mocking protesters and an impatience for a multi-ethnic egalitarian future embodied by this new trope of Congresswomen, black, Arab American and Latina. Both groups were determined to shape the future of their respective parties and the country's trajectory. More than anything, the gap was generational. Youth and color versus an aging, shrinking white minority that felt both disenfranchised by a contemporary and shifting nation, a nation that, as their t-shirts proclaimed, was full and emboldened by the Trump presidency to express a racism that many Americans had believed was outmoded after eight years of a black president. The United States of these first women of their generation and race to represent their communities in Washington, D.C. was a pluralistic one striving toward egalitarianism and sustained by rather than suspicious of government. It was integrated into the world around it, which held riches to be embraced and absorbed. To them, it's the gulf felt insurmountable and demoralizing. This is such a frightening and troubling time, Escobar told me a week after her trip. It's very difficult to find hope. Yet for so many millions of Americans, the world does not feel so starkly rendered. Many people outside the Beltway and political Twitter live lives defined by prosaic decisions. Mow the lawn or watch Netflix, brave the traffic or use public transportation, pay their medical bills or buy groceries, yoga or orange theory, onion rings or french fries. Their dealings with members of Congress are rare and generally to be avoided as such an interaction would likely signal a problem with their social security check or a shakedown for a campaign donation. The left and the right have taken turns over generations shouting, where's the outrage? And demanding that someone return their country to them. But we are all the sum product of a nation that has been both taken from us and renewed. Just as 20 years before President Obama's election, his presidency would have been unimaginable. Five years before Trump's, his presidency would have been even more so. Both of these errors resulted from the collective choice of US citizens however divided and driven in part by the whimsical choices of a narrow swath of voters who chose to show up on election day. But the scene in Clint, Texas made the choice feel more stark, not one between political parties or theories or philosophies, but rather the core of the nation's identity. Thank you so much. I love that section of the book. I'm going to ask you our first question from the audience. Great. 
What do you think progressive women will have to do in the 2020 election to ensure similar successes as 2018? Will they have to shift their strategies to win big and contribute to a possible blue wave? Um, so here's the thing about a blue wave. And this is what any woman who ran in Republican districts, even if they've governed a little bit more to the left than they might have run in all over the country, is they will tell you that a blue wave cannot be done with Democrats alone and progressives alone. Because to win in a wave, you have to do two things. You have to um, largely galvanize that base that you're kind of referring to and really get people out to vote. Young people who love to um, engage in politics and engage in the political um, space, you know, as we saw it engaging on Instagram and, and, and on Twitter and social media and other ways, but don't necessarily vote and who are um, maybe very, feeling other kinds of Democratic voters, which we did see get engaged in certain districts. Um, I would point especially to like Johanna Hayes in Connecticut. Um, who don't normally vote maybe, or, or don't vote as, you know, not we call them low propensity voters, getting all those folks out um, to vote. Yes, they'll have to do that. But in many districts, especially those that are Republican districts or moderate, you know, kind of mixed districts, you have to also, to have that kind of galvanization in our country, they'll have to also in many places um, convince uh, uh, independent and Republican voters to come along. And that's really, um, that's part of the challenge. And I know that um, some folks on the left sort of try to hew to one component of that, of, of getting more of their voters out. But in many districts in our country and states, there aren't enough of those voters. So um, the problem that progressives run into uh, legislatively on the Hill and politically out in the world is they believe that their um, ideas are the best for their party, but they can't always get their base voters to agree with that, as we even saw in the race of 2020. And they don't kind of understand that even if there's any possibility for their ideas at any point coming to fruition, they have to find ways to connect with people who don't necessarily agree with that and still bring them along to the broader message. So this is something, listen, you know, and the, and the progressive left often doesn't kind of want to hear that piece of it. And this became a conflict uh, in the in the 116th Congress. But this is really um, the truth about how they went uh, beyond, you know, a discreet democratically controlled district. The next question is currently the highest voted. Is it possible mm -hmm. for Democrats to take back the Senate? The current political sclerosis will continue unless that happens. Um, so I'm super allergic to making political um, predictions, especially because we could have been having this conversation when my book came out in March, and this was just all beginning, and we would be one conversation. We could have had this conversation um, six months ago, before we knew anything about COVID-19 and you could ask me that question and I would have answered it perhaps differently, but whatever I would have said would have been irrelevant because COVID-19 did happen and that's obviously gonna be impactful and we don't have yet, uh, we can't even know in, in what ways. Um, having said all that, um, a couple things. So just as we sort of saw in 2018, definitely see in 2020, of course the race will be a referendum on Donald Trump. Of course, that's always true with the incumbent president. And so his fortunes um, will, it's very likely, um, history would show this and, and everything we're seeing in the polls so far, although it's to be careful of polls as we've all learned, but would, un, would, would um, make us guess that the fortunes of Republicans in the Senate may be connected to the president, especially since most of them, the vast majority of Republicans that have really tied themselves to Trump at this point. Um, and try to galvanize their own base and remain popular with Republican-based voters. But it's absolutely possible, and Republicans, I, and I'm not saying this to you as a New York Times reporter or a book author, in my opinion, I'm telling you that Republicans in the Senate know um, that they definitely are in a fight. In the conversation about vice president, the Democrats are looking, it seems, for women from the Senate or as governors. Do you believe that below that level, Congress people or state legislative leaders should or would be considered? Oh, that's super interesting. I mean, I don't know. I, I think that um, 
we've always kind of put a premium on legislative or executive experience. Um, and then obviously Donald Trump really upended that. And to some degree, I mean, obviously Barack Obama had been a U.S. Senator and State Senator for a very short period, you know. So in a sense, he was certainly fairly new to federal politics. Um, but it's just always been historically so hard for um, for those lower offices uh, to um, to get that shot, mostly because I think, for, if nothing else, People want someone that has some name recognition and has already proven that they can galvanize and bring some folks along. Um, and if anything, I would, I would note, again, without being predictive at all, I would note that um, in this crisis, the profile um, and the respect for and the interest in governors has really gone up a lot. And so I would, um, governors have been a little out of fashion um, in politics, but I would I would wonder about um, get them getting a second look because of this crisis in that context. What can Nancy Pelosi teach the squad, and what can the squad teach Nancy Pelosi? I get asked a variation of that a lot, um, or how did she manage them? Um, and I think so. Okay. These women came in and they'd run their own campaigns and they'd won their own way. A lot of them won without the support of the party because, you know, they kind of didn't want them to run, whether it was challenging an incumbent, which the, you know, the House leadership never likes, um, or they weren't their pick. Donna Shalala, we know we kind of forget to talk about her sometimes. She's the oldest female member to ever be in the House. And this is someone who was obviously the cabinet secretary. The party didn't want her to run. They, they had other candidates in mind for that Miami area seat. And she said, well, forget it. I don't like the field, so I'm just going to do it myself. And she won pretty handily. Um, others had more of a struggle, but they ran um, sometimes in very crowded Democratic fields. Again, sometimes beating Republicans. And they did it their way. They raised money in their own way. They used social media in their own way. They kind of ran outside the system, if you will. And again, sometimes without the support of or even, you know, in some cases against the uh, desires of the party. So why am I bringing this up? Because they, they come with a certain confidence. They come with a, um, a validation from their district, um, a sense that they overcame you know, a lot of a crowded field. They overcame Republicans, whatever they did. And they did it. They got here. And then they get to the House and everyone, the kind of attitude is, well, how we do things here is you're freshmen. And yeah, there's a lot of you. And yeah, a lot of you have these amazing uh, careers before you got here. Teacher of the Year in Johanna Hayes' case, um, Chrissy Houlihan, very impressive uh, military and private sector uh, career, all kinds of women uh, in similar situations. But we're very seniority driven here. In, in the House of Representatives, you stand up, you stand in line at a press conference by seniority. They look at the back of your member pin and it has the the order in which you were elected. It's all about seniority. And so that was a real chafing at the beginning, especially since, as you all remember, Nancy Pelosi was not a human to become speaker again. She had to fight for that. And a lot of these women on the left and center ran in part by saying they wouldn't vote for her. And some didn't. She ended up galvanizing, getting these people to vote for her which is a testament to, once again, Nancy Pelosi and her carrot and stick approach to things. And obviously, we all know she became speaker again and um, then had to, to face freshmen, not just the squad, but many freshmen who were very outspoken, very headstrong, and felt like they needed to have more of a say, maybe it's just in their, also just in their numbers and the fact that they had taken back the House. They wanted more kind of saying and power than your typical freshman. And in some ways she obliged that. She gave them subcommittee chairmanship. She gave them different roles. Um, and in the course of becoming, trying to get people's votes for speakers, she did a lot of wooing um, all around. So, um, so Nancy Pelosi, having been speaker before in difficult times with it, in some ways I would argue a house Democratic Party that was in some ways more politically diverse, which is to say there were some really conservative Democrats the first time around for her. Um, she had to always manage the far left, the far right, and the far most moderate, the most left, everything in between. She's very skilled at that. She's done that a long time. 
And so she was able to do that. Um, and I think that she was seeing from younger people that they were the future of the party and this is where everything is going. And, and that she has to, uh, to bend and realize that her power ultimately will be waning. But at the same time, okay, so this was what I observed, all right? I'm not inside Nancy Pelosi's head. But this is what I think. And she, you know, doesn't show her cards in this way. I think what frustrated her, she didn't like members fighting with each other. And she didn't like um, um, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez threatening primary challenges and, and threatening members who, you know, voted with their district more conservatively uh, than some of them did. Um, she didn't like that. She wanted to stay unified. That was a huge thing for her. But I also think... In terms of learning, she learned, she saw how much political power they could have outside the institution and how what a force they could be outside. And I think what she wanted was for them to take that power, all those social media followers, all those television appearances that freshmen in a house would normally never get, all that attention, all that political clout. And she wanted them to use that as a force for good in the house within the party. And I think that's what she tried to impart upon them, that they would be more powerful if they use that clout um, to kind of try to unify and be part of a team, if you will, instead of saying, hey, we're the progressive future and and you better you know vote the way we want you to vote. And I think that was what she was trying to communicate and sometimes was frustrated with. And I think that there was some, there was some impact in, in that way. I noticed, um, AOC really supported far fewer um, challengers this year, and I also noticed that um, they are far they are challenging her less so far. I mean, it's kind of hard to say because like Congress isn't around right now, and the progressive left, you know, in these new bills and the bailout um, to, to address the COVID um, crisis, progressives are certainly pushing their agenda and 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 having conflict with Nancy Pelosi, but it isn't the quad as per se. Um, and when we talk about the squad, I always like to say Anna Presley's, you know, very, very, very infrequently having conflict with the speaker or, or the leadership or speaking out um, in meetings. Um, you know, they are they're not a monolith. I mean, they are their own people and they do operate and vote and do things in their own way. So I think um, in short, she appreciated um, what they accomplished and, and she appreciated and had to be in awe of the sort of perhaps at times confusing and not not, not her world. <laughs> Um, social media, political power they had outside the institution, but she just really wanted that harness internally. And so that's where there was both the conflict and an attempt, I think, to have a resolution. In speaking about seniority, I actually noted a sentence. It's right after in the book, right after you're speaking with Jahan Hayes, and she's wondering why everyone is lined up by seniority for a press conference. And you write, yeah. Why was the length of term, rather than the difficulty of the race or the number of new voters brought into the polls, the measure of success and entitlement? It was so striking to me. Um, for this for this group to run their campaign in their own way, and so much emphasis was placed on their authenticity, how are they doing, or how did you see them doing in the first two years, just in terms of getting accustomed to all these very old roles and old processes? So the short answer is it was a struggle, um, but not equally so. Um, for people who had served in public office before, um, I think um, that there was more understanding of just some of the procedural and weird stuff that you know goes on. Well, even for them, I mean, Rashida Tlaib always said, "Oh, you know, people could never speak to me in the Michigan legislature the way people you know speak on the floor of of Congress and so forth." So. Um, um, so, um, I, I think, um, that for people who had been ex in the executive branch of government or been in the military, which is like a whole different structure, there were, that was also hard to deal with. Um, but, um, because they would be like, well, you know, there were just things being like running on time, you know, or meetings being structured in a certain way. And why is this so disorganized? <laughs> or why don't people show up on time and so forth? Um, so that was like their kind of struggle. And then there were people who were struggling with kind of what I mentioned uh, before, the sense of, hey, you know, I won this great race and, and I'm so popular, I'm a rock star back home. Why do I have to sit and be quiet here? Um, there were people who were who were like, well, you know, 
we travel on these schedules that are very untenable. We have, we, we have um, committee hearings that are all at the same time. So you have to keep like bouncing from room to room. Why is it that way? That's how it's done. Well, why is it done that way? That's stupid. I can't attend my full committee hearing. My, my schedule isn't, doesn't work out. Well, it's because of the way it's done. Kind of like this is the way we do things. That was not um, an answer that people wanted to necessarily hear. And so I think people struggled a lot with that. Um, and even it was interesting to me. I always remember about how the moms kind of all got together and tried to redo the congressional schedule to more follow the school calendar, which seems okay, pretty normal, you know. Um, but that was a, its own, its own, you know, amazing thing to accomplish for them. So a lot of it's just stupid stuff that we all don't think about, or sometimes in our workplaces we do think about that are very antiquated. Um, even like what you're allowed to wear, um, how you're allowed to address people on the floor, um, how what you're allowed to do, you know, procedurally and how you vote and things. And that's not the kind of stuff they don't teach you that in orientation. When you're in orientation, they're kind of talking to you about how to sign up for health care and all the other kind of onboarding that many people see in the private sector. And they're not really learning how to be lawmakers. And it's pretty complicated. And I think some people were frustrated by the lack of, of that preparation. Um, but at the same time, um, you know, the Hill is this ginormous, sprawling city, really, with its restaurants and a post office, you know, and you're just having to get to kind of know a small town, really, know your way around a town, you know, where the bathrooms are, um, uh, how, how can you ever get lunch in between those meals? So I think there were these sort of natural difficulties, the commuting difficulties, the last minute changes in the voting schedule difficulties especially if people had families back home and how to kind of make it their own way. You mentioned Johanna Hayes. And I think in that conversation, she said that her staff would come and say, okay, you know, 11, 1130, this 11, 30, and 1230, we had this lunch meeting and she would say, well, no, I'm not going to do that because um, at lunchtime I have a um, FaceTime with my daughter and I help her with her homework or something. And they said, well, you can't do anything. Lunchtime. That's an important time. We have to meet with, you know, donor to do things on lunchtime. She said, I'm not going to do that. Just like during her campaign, they wanted her not to quit her teaching job. And she said wasn't, she wasn't going to do that. So I think they're trying to change some things that we all take for granted in the workplace, um, or they're just like particularly weird to Congress, but, they, but they're trying to do it. And before, I think most people, when they get to Washington, they might chafe at things and be annoyed, but then they kind of, they, they kind of cleave to the ways. And I think they have tried in their own ways to try and break some of that stuff. It's hard, though. In the majority of cases, women still have to be asked to run, where men mm -hmm. just look in the mirror and think, congressmen. A, mm -hmm. do you think that is changing? And B, do you see a more concerted effort among Republicans to recruit women? Yeah, definitely. So there's a chapter in the book, as you know, on just on Republican women. Um, we were having a little chat in the margin here before we were doing our getting our technical kinks worked out about this show, Mrs. America which is the story of the ERA um, and um, talks about, um, it's a story of the ERA and Phyllis Shapley's you know, movement to, to finally kill its ratification in the States. Um, and what's really interesting among other things about that show, which I highly recommend you can get on Hulu, it's great, um, is seeing Republican and Democratic women work together uh, toward, toward the passage of and the attempts to ratify the ERA. And that's not something you see so much in Congress anymore. So the role of women in terms of a unifying force together um, um, was not so much, thank you, was not, um, it was more in existence then because women at that time largely did not have a lot of power on committees. You know, they didn't um, have, certainly hold gavels. And so they kind of used the women's caucus to to try and have power to um, to promulgate a agenda for you know things like you know things that were important to women and families that they agreed upon and that's like a really striking thing if you watch that show and it was striking to me doing the research how important the women's caucus was and they kind of tried to stay away from a lot of social issues um, uh, like abortion and so forth so they could kind of work on policy things together you just don't see that so much anymore and I don't think that that is um, the reason for, but nor do I think it's a coincidence that as that has disintegrated since the 90s, um, you see fewer and fewer Republican women who've won seats in Congress. Um, they've moved more and more to the right. Um, and this and it makes it more difficult both for them as women to get through these primaries now as the parties become more conservative 
but then even to get elected in some places. So what I did not know, of course I knew that Republican women had lost ground in 2018, but only until I started researching the book did I realize how precipitous and, co and, and, and constant that decline has been for them over the last decade in all legislative branches and in Congress. And I talked to a lot of Republican women and I did feel this was an important chapter even though they were not part of this historic class, quite the opposite. But it was worth um, looking at that history, which was very interesting to me, but also say, hey, what are you guys gonna do about this? Because <laughs> you want women in Congress, right? Um, and there are some organizations that work um, on a nonpartisan level to elect women. And I think that they did look at those women and they saw that they appealed to women, especially suburban women who were kind of turned off by Donald Trump. And that's, you know, they're in a hard position because if they go against Trump, they have a hard time in a primary then they can't, you know, win in a general. Um, sometimes they then yoke themselves too much to that. So they're in a tough spot. But I think they did watch women win and they thought, well, I don't share their policy vision, but I, I'm in, it, it, I, they will say to me privately, they were inspired by them. And they realize that women can can win and what's going on. So I, a lot more Republican women have um, have um, sought to run in 2020. Whether they'll get through their primaries, whether they'll get through their general elections, you know, obviously remains to be seen. Uh, we're not at the end of that story yet. But definitely, I bet you'll see about double the number of women who actually um, uh, register to run this time. Have you seen the, the conversation change at all in terms of experience and who is qualified to hold office? For men, it's kind of a point of pride to be among the people, to know your constituents. Mm -hmm. For women, the question is always, what kind of experience do you have? Have you seen that um, conversation change at all with this freshman class? Yeah, I mean, it's funny that you asked the question that way because I didn't think of it so much as a shift and that you're perceiving it that way is interesting to me. Um, what I do know is that absolutely it was about going door to door and knowing each person in your house district. I think a lot of Alyssa Slotkin who went, I think it was called snowshoes on the ground in central Michigan and just going out like that um, and really just trying to um, meet as many people and connect with people in, the, in their district. A lot of times in places, the Democrats case where Democrats never went, Lauren Underwood, who I mentioned um, is from Naperville, which is a suburb of Chicago, but her district actually stretches quite out into the farmlands. I went to her district uh, to hang out with her once and um, it was like, you know, feed stores and silos, you know, it was a whole different thing when she got there. And she said she would stand in these fields with voters where Democrats hadn't been in 10 years and try to connect with people, principally for her around the issues of health care. And health care was a huge issue in 2018 because a lot of what women ran on was the Republican attempt to undo the Affordable Care Act. And there were a lot of districts where Trump was even perhaps popular or not as unpopular, but that was not popular. That move. So they might not talk about the president because that might not be a winning message for them, but they would talk about health care and, and try to capitalize on Democrats being more associated um, with that issue. And um, so in terms of experience, yeah, I think it was two things. I think it was more about their position on the issue of health care because it was so huge and their ability to connect and be authentic to and for their district. And when they got elected, when they got came into office, as you all might remember, it was a middle of a government shutdown. And so the first recess was truncated because they had to go back to Washington and work on um, you know, a bill to end that. And these women who I was kind of just starting to hang out with, and I was really disappointed too. I had this really cool trip planned to all these districts and I'd like undo each leg of that trip. And it was, I think I went with Ilhan Omar to Minneapolis, but I didn't get to do, and Angie Craig, who's from the suburbs there, I didn't get to do much of that trip because of that, but they didn't get to go home and they were really teed off. I mean, they were really um, upset and kind of panicked, even though it was their literally their first month in office because that's what they understood. They understood if I'm in my district and I'm listening to people talk about you know, the price of their EpiPens um, or their insulin, other potholes and all that kind of stuff. I'm feeling okay, I'm feeling safe. I'm feeling like I'm with my people. I'm feeling like this is, I can get reelected. Even though again, you know, why are you running for office already? But they're already in that mindset, you know. That was where, um, that was their that was their comfortable space. Um, and so I definitely think staying close to the district um, was important for these women 
and all the Democrats who won. And I think it's kind of interesting because you don't hear as much on a national level about anyone right now because Congress is not in session. But I've talked to some of them and even done some events with a few of them. And they are very, very much integrated in the district right now trying to respond to this crisis. This is another question from our audience. Did Gabby Gifford's election to Congress in 2010 lead the way for the women running for Senate in Arizona? Oh, huh, that's interesting. Hmm, you caught me off guard with that one. That's really interesting. And of course, everybody knows that that before um, that tragedy of, um, of Gabby being shot, people were thinking that she was going to run for the Senate, you know? So, every, I mean, pretty seriously. Um, so, wow, because Kirsten said it was such a different character from her. I think, I don't know if I would, I would say that. I would say that you know, Arizona is such a unique state too. You know, they really kind of pride themselves on being, you know, being Arizona. And I think that's why, you know, Kristen Sinema, who was the first female ever elected to the Senate in Arizona, um, last I checked, was the most popular politician in the entire state. And that was a state that I haven't looked recently at what's happened in the, in the COVID situation because that's impacted governors, but they had a, 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 a pretty popular governor. So that was quite a thing definitely more popular than she is among her democratic colleagues in the Senate. So she's such an iconoclast. She kind of does her own thing. Um, and, and Martha McSally was always pretty ambitious. So I kind of look at them as their own people in that sense and, and how they fit into their state, especially cinema. And she of course had been in the legislature and was a known person, certainly at least in Maricopa County where she, she came from. But I think um, what Giffords, I don't know about paving the way for them. I'm not sure I, I, I can answer, speak to that. I'm not sure that I would know the answer to that. But what I will say is that in the case of cinema, and now of course Gabby Gifford's um, husband, Mark Kelly is running against Martha McSally. So we'll take that out of it because that's that's more than a little bias. But I would say she, her endorsement um, of women, of, de of candidates, um, both as Gabby Gifford's, um, Gabby Gifford's, but also um, as being sort of a leader um, in the gun safety movement, um, gun control movement, however you want to phrase it, uh, that imprimatur is has been extremely important and people, Democrats want her nod. Has the fall of Katie Hill been a disappointment to the freshman class? Oh, that's interesting too. I, again, I'm interested that you frame that in terms of her being, um, in terms of the Democratic class, because I think that there were feeling, I'm just plugging in a little bit here. I think that her feeling, I think that the Katie Hill situation, in case anyone doesn't remember what happened, is that she came into Congress and she was very popular. She was elected by her peers to be a leader of the freshman class. And she was this huge pet of Nancy Pelosi's. And they don't necessarily talk about that anymore, but she really, really was. Um, and in that leadership role, she played a big role. She had a big seat at the table. And I think that people really saw her as a leader and she was on TV a lot. And what was interesting is she's somebody who beat a Republican. And so she was in, a, I would say a modestly Republican district. You know, they have a special election there now and we're gonna see what happens. And it's possible that a Republican is gonna take back that seat as a result of what happened and of Katie Hill losing, losing, you know, having to resign from Congress. But um, I think that the issue was that because she went out in sort of a, you know, in a Me Too, in a Me Too I issue, you know, kind of a, a sex scandal, if you will, there was a lot of focus on whether there was a double standard, that she was not getting away with something that men had been getting away with in Congress all this time, and here that these women had been elected against the backdrop of Me Too, and how could this, you know, this terrible double standard have happened, and what a disappointment this was for women at a time when you had the most women in Congress in this historic class. I have a little different take on that, which is that number one, if you are gonna codify as they did in this Congress, and it's hard to believe it, you know, it took till now, but to codify sexual harassment and conduct rules for members of Congress, right? Of course, they're gonna to apply to everybody. Yes, there are many men who've gotten away with a lot of stuff in Congress and in all workplaces over the years, but I will also tell you as someone who covered Congress, that that's, it wasn't, you know, John Boehner had no patience for that. And I saw him throw out more than one men over smaller allegations and more quickly, um, you know, when the Katie Hill got the benefit of the doubt from Nancy Pelosi and the leadership team until it seemed to involve a possible staffer. The other thing that I'll say is that taking out the content 
of the scandal that brought her down, which obviously was, um, you know, the sexual harassment slash impropriety. The fact that she had gotten herself in that position, you divorcing yourself from a moment of whether it was a double standard or not. The fact that she had conducted herself in this way in a campaign, and look, Katie Hill, you asked me about authenticity. You know, Katie Hill was this free millennial spirit, and she, you know, raised money her own way, and the Vice documentary captured her campaign, and she was cursing and making all these sexual innuendos. People found she's fun, and she was kind of this, this sort of, oh, this is what you can get in Congress now, this open, um, this woman who's openly bisexual, but but also married, and she's like gets these like crazy goats on her, you know, on her property, and she's a free spirit, but she can also be a policy mind and be in the oversight committee and do all this stuff, and that was kind of a new a new face, right? A new type of person who could be in Congress, a new type of person who we didn't think could be a member of the House, and at the same time, some of the choices that she made, whether or not you believe it was correct or there was a double standard there, may have demonstrated in my mind, a lack of judgment that people expect from their member of Congress and, and how people conduct themselves in what is a really um, high and important office in our government. So I have a little different take on that. But I think that it was, um, I will say that I think it was hard on, on the House um, because, you know, here they had this historic, exciting class. And before the year is even out, someone has to leave in a scandal cause a special election that could result in the Democrats losing a seat there, who knows. And so, um, and it was obviously a very unpleasant situation. And I think it was, it was, uh, it was disappointing for them, but I don't think to be perfectly candid with you, I don't think it was, um, it didn't change the trajectory of things. You've been on Capitol Hill, uh, I think since 2010. And yeah. I'm wondering what, who were you following, first of all? Who were you following leading up to 2018? And with this class, what what were your expectations or what were your hopes? Oh, um, you know, I go into everything. Kind of, so I always say, you know, I take policy very seriously and I take policy makers as seriously as they earn to be taken, right? So you never know. In a, in a House of Representatives, you have people who are amazing brains and such impressive people. And then you have clowns, right? You have that mix and you don't know what's gonna show up. And so to me, it's just the story. Who's this gonna be? Who are these people? What are we gonna find? Um, and so I just kind of wanted to know, I was just sort of excited to, to, to learn about who was going to be, who was going to ex be exciting? Who was gonna come in with all kinds of attention and kind of fizzle? Cause that always happens too. Who was going to be someone like Katie Porter, in my view, who was kind of more behind the scenes or, or not as high profile in the beginning, but, but bringing it to these committee hearings every week and really grill, drilling witnesses and, 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 you know, getting a lot of answers out of people, getting people to say really interesting things. But that was kind of under the radar there for a while. But you could see that when people caught on to that, they were going to, you know, really um, see a special, a special and interesting person there, a complicated person, by the way. Um, but... You, you're just you for right for the purposes of writing a book you're trying to identify these people early on because you kind of want to know well who am I going to focus on there's so many of these women yeah we know we're going to have to write about AOC obviously everyone wants to know about her Ilhan Omar is clearly going to be an interesting figure um but who's trying to suss out who's going to make an impact that was that was the kind of the game I had to play in my head and so watching that play out and seeing who who would rise, who would fall, who would be impactful, that was what interested me. Um, so I can't say anybody disappointed me. I think it's, um, I think the only way I could feel disappointment is if they were boring, because then the story would be disappointing and then my book would be really boring. So I was, I was not really afraid of that happening, but that would be my only fear and my only worry. My dream was for people to be interesting, and sparky and compelling and and funny and and fun to watch and, and you know controversial not for the sake of controversy in the way people meet people think that the media craves that although there's some truth to that because the media loves conflict but more because what would that tell us about what it means to have 25 percent of women not quite in congress what would that tell us about the future of the democratic party what would that presage for us about 2020 
So any of this, these kind of conflicts to me um, were stories about our country. You know, everyone's representing where they come from and they're bringing the interests of their district and their constituents and their states and their points of view. And they're always trying to be there in the house for their constituents. They know what the people back home think and want, even if it's in conflict, maybe sometimes with what, what they might necessarily want to do on their own volition, not answering anybody, but they do answer the people. You're there to represent people. And so when you're talking about on the floor and you're voting a certain way, you're doing that on behalf of all the people in your district, which people forget about, you know, these personalities become singular or even sui generis, but they're not the representatives of people at home just doing normal stuff, you know? And so what's the country doing their normal stuff? Where are they? That, that's what we, we think we're seeing. And so those are the, so those stories, um, while it's a lot of it's, you know, seems like political BS and, you know, the usual um, transients and stuff like that, and people get frustrated and, and jaded about it, which I get. You can't forget, you have to remember, when you're watching the executive branch, you're watching this guy, the people that he picked around him, right? When you're watching the legislative branch, you're watching the, uh, you're watching the people, especially in the people's house, in the House of Representatives, the people that our country sent there. So their story is truly the story of our country. And that's what I think is just so fascinating and why the House is just so interesting. And if you talk to reporters who cover Congress, they like that. They don't, or they don't crave to become White House reporters. They, they like to see that display. Um, and I think that's worth keeping in mind when you look at members of Congress who kind of make you sick or you hate them or you don't understand what they think a certain way. And remember that for better or worse or how you feel about them, they're representing their district and they're telling you the story of a part of America that you may never have been to or don't know about. And that's what makes that, um, that's what interested me. And that was what, you know, to, to be excited by that and to, to be able to do it justice. I think that's where, where my brain kind of stayed. That's a long answer. And I'm not even sure it was the answer to your question. <laughs> That was perfect. That's kind of where my head went. We have one more question from the yes. audience. Mm -hmm, please. What is the role of social media in making the freshman women a force to be reckoned with? Many people saw the shoes AOC was wearing when she knocked on doors because of Instagram. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, here's the thing I find interesting and also confounding. Like you said, they know their shoes. You know what else? Remember her lipstick sold out. She had a specific brand of lipstick. It might have been MAC. I don't remember. It sold this red lipstick that she wore. It's in her campaign videos and stuff. And she got to the hill. That sold out. You know, everyone found out she did run, rent the runway. I mean, you're right. She was like a, like, it's kind of like a Jackie O figure in that sense. You know, people want to look like her and, and get her stuff. And other members of Congress too have been sort of um, iconic in that way. It's kind of the way um, Shirley Chisholm was in some ways. Um, what I don't understand about that is that they politically, it's very galvanizing. And I can tell you that in mid February, I was in Paris and I was walking down the street and I looked up and there was a poster affiche of, and there was AOC on a poster <laughs> in Paris. That freshman last member. Okay. Remember that? So that's showing you her, full, you know, it's for, I think it's for like a liberal radio station. So that's showing you that in, around the world, they see her as this liberal icon. And I think social media has obviously elevated her and some of her um, her freshman colleagues as political figures. And as you're pointing out, cultural figures are people want the stuff that they want and listen to the music they listen to and play the video games that they play. But what I find confounding is that that doesn't necessarily, as I kind of alluded to earlier, translate into the voting booth. And that's where I think the disconnect sort of happens still. Uh, I had a question. You write about a story that Senator Patty Murray shared with you that revealed how the ways in which Congress talks about policy has shifted dramatically. Would you tell that story and talk about this culture shift and whether it has lasted? Yes, sure. Um, so Patty Murray was in that wave of the year of the women when a bunch of women were elected and 92 and um, kind of in the wake, by the way, of the Anita Hill hearings, as, as, as many people here would remember. And um, she got to the Senate and she went down to the Senate floor to talk about a bill. And I'm kind of sure, I'm sorry, I'm not, I, I won't waste your time flipping through my book to find it, but I think, because it doesn't matter, but I think it was a bill about um, maybe um, kind of financing drugs or something along those lines. And um, 
this is a what someone who ran as so-called a mom in tennis shoes you know came off the school board and was running on those kinds of issues who by the way is an extremely powerful woman in the u.s senate now uh, when the democrats had control held to gavel she's the minority leader on a lot of committees she's you know a big force in democratic leadership there um and she went down to the floor of the Senate, and as you may or may not know, I don't know how much you guys are all Congress buffs, but you go down to the floor of the Senate, and it's not like there's TV cameras. They're not, first of all, they're not even allowed. They're just you know reporters with no pads up in the gallery. You can't see them, and you have a C-SPAN camera, and they kind of give their speech before the C-SPAN camera. So if you happen to be watching C-SPAN, which you're not, you'll catch it, but then it's made and captured and tapes, and it lives on in YouTube and everything. So now, right? So she goes down to give her speech to no one, basically, and she talks about a mom back in her state who um, had a child, I believe, with leukemia and how she was kind of trying to make a decision. I think it maybe went like a family leave type, not that precisely that, but a family leave type piece of legislation. And she was talking about how this mom was struggling to figure out how to take off time to take care of her sick child. And she left the floor and an older senator, male senator, came up to her and he said, Senator Murray, when we talk about legislation on the floor, we, we bring you know, bar charts and, and graphs. And we don't tell personal stories. And she was really shocked by that. And said, well, how is he supposed to make people connect with the legislation, you know? And she, of course, she didn't change her way. They all do that now. You go down to the Senate floor and tell a story with bar charts and things like that. I mean, no one does that. That's not it, it animating at all. Everyone tells personal. I don't care if you're the most conservative, most liberal state in the nation or district. People go and tell stories about people from their districts. They personalize legislation. Um, and I think that maybe people aren't sitting around watching C SPAN, so they may not know this change that you and I've just discussed. But I think people intuitively understand that when politicians, when they go hear them speak at rallies and stuff like that, they're always trying to personalize policy because, of, of course, policy is only meaningful and it only matters as it impacts all of us. Thank you so much to Jennifer Steinhauer for joining us tonight with her book, The First. It was a fantastic discussion. It's an Thank excellent you. book to have shared the company of you and these other wise women when I've been quarantined with no women has been the perfect medicine to celebrate this conversation and this freshman class. I think we should all make Jeanette Rankin's lemon pie this weekend. Please, it's delicious, do it, yes. Thank you, and thank you, and um, I would love for you guys all to buy my book, of course, but in any case, buy books now and support independent bookstores. Um, uh, they need your help, and it's great to read, and it's great to support those stores and to buy some great books. I'm in a literary group with, with people who have um, books coming out right now. It's called Lockdown Lit. You can find us on Instagram, Lockdown Lit. And um, there's so many great books coming out right now. So I just encourage everyone to support uh, writers and the, and the bookstores and the publishing industry. And thank you, everyone. And thank you for the library for hosting this wonderful event. And for everyone here, your patience um, with our technical glitches. That's just part of the era that we're in. Hopefully, we won't remember that part. We'll remember this great conversation um, with so many of you who I'm honored to have uh, joined us tonight. You can follow us on Crowdcast and visit us online at freelibrary.org slash author events to access our digital archives and our updated event schedule. Thank you so much for joining us tonight and keep reading. Thank you. Good night, everybody.